thank you so much for taking time to talk with me. I'd love to hear your story first. Um, obviously, there's so many things going on now about it's kind of this, it seems like there's this time where we're reexamining the the racial history of our country. Um, obviously, immigration is a big part of that. I'd love to hear you know how you came into working on this book and how is it applicable to what we're talking about today? Yeah, I really stumbled into it. I, I, you know, edit full time. I didn't think that I was going to write a book, um, but came across this law, the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act at the LBJ Museum in Austin that I just happened to stop by uh, before I hopped on a flight back home from, from going to a friend's wedding. And they mentioned this law in a room in the museum about the Great Society and describe it very briefly as a law that really changed the country forever in particular because it allowed so many people from outside Europe to come, especially Asian Americans. And so I began to wonder like, is this law why my family is here? And I think with immigration generally, like every, you know, most families have some kind of story of it's sort of a genealogy, right? Of like, we came with this wave and now we're here. And this is sort of, you know, our, your, the grandfather came at this time, great, great grandfather, whatever it is, all the way back to the Mayflower, right? There's some story. And I think, for me, what was so interesting about this doing the research is that it became clear that there are laws that make it possible for people to be here. So because we have these laws that we've erected, you know, more and more complex in the last hundred years, really before that it was more or less open borders. The reason your family here is here isn't just some like, you know, these are inspiring stories of long journeys and people, you know, defeating the odds to be here. But a lot of the times it's like a legal story, right? Of like, do you, why did you get papers that make you legal and able to come here when other people can't? Um, and so learning about that just really, for me, changed how I see immigration in this country and our debate, you know, and, and um, we talk about demographic change a lot, but I don't think we spend a lot of time thinking about how we got here and why all these people from outside Europe are here. We kind of take it for granted, you know, it's like we're a nation of immigrants, so all these people are here. And what I learned through my research is that it's because of this law and it's laws like this that decide what our demographic fate is. Um, and especially right now, you know, being Asian, you know, or if you're Hispanic, like you're not black or white. And I think often we think about race as a black white issue. And yet there are all these millions of new people in this country who are neither black nor white and kind of figuring out how those people fit in, I think is very much like of the moment. One thing I was struck by when you talk about what's happening now, it seems like there's always the, the narrative of the specific person whose life changes things, or it seems to, you know, with, with George Floyd, that particular instance brings back all these things from reconstruction to the last hundred years of Jim Crow and everything else. Can you talk a little bit about, in your book, the kind of the individuals who made this bigger story happen? For me, there's one person whose life is just sort of an extraordinary um, through line for the whole thing. And that's Manny Seller, who's congressman from Brooklyn, one of the longest serving congressmen in the history of Congress. Um, he's the grandson of German Jewish immigrants. And he grows up in Brooklyn, born and raised in Brooklyn, serves Brooklyn. And when he enters office, it's the 20s. And so these immigration quotas are passed in 1924. And then he basically spends the next 40 years trying to undo them. And he's there for the whole journey, every part of it, right? From, from through the Holocaust, trying to convince the US to change its immigration laws to actually allow refugees to come in all the way through the 50s and the McCarthyist wars, which I talk about in my book. And through 1965, his name is on the law. It's the Hart Seller Act and it's Manny Seller's name on it. So I find his story just extraordinary because he's someone who really, you know, it's a long battle. Like it takes 40 years to do this. And I think it's kind of amazing. Like other people in my book sort of come and go, you know, depending on the moment, but there is this one person who just never, ever stops. And he's also really important because he's chair of the House Judiciary Committee in the 60s under LBJ when he's mm -hmm. passing all this really landmark legislation, Civil Rights Act, uh, Voting Rights Act, you know, all this stuff is going through Manny Seller. So this was a person I felt was, incredibly important in you know 20th century American history who there hasn't been a book on him before. It's very hard to find information about him, um, but I just found him to be a really compelling person. Um, I wanna ask you, so like, 
you know, how I, I was just struck reading your book, how many parallels there are, obviously, like I, you know, I've been editing coverage of the coronavirus and I was amazed, like the way that a lot of things have changed, but, you know, we have obviously much more scientific knowledge. We have sanitation standards, which as you described, we didn't have back then, but there are things that are similar, like people, the disease getting here and no one really knowing mm -hmm. they're not really being like contact tracing, you know, like the first person dies in, in, on the mainland in San Francisco and everyone's like, is this the first case? Like, do we even know? And that happened in Seattle. So what has it been like for you to, to experience the pandemic knowing so much about this history? It's been very eerie. <laughs> and the best way to say it, it's, you know, at first when it happened, it was like, oh, this, this is somewhat similar. I can kind of see the parallels. And now it's one month, now three months and four months. And you say, wait, this is the exact same story happening again. And how is this possible? Yeah. Um, that's one of those things that, you know, I went into this book. I started the book in 2016, which was, you know, this was, you know, even a year ago, there was no idea, idea of COVID or anything else. I was brought to it just because it seemed like this great story of personalities that you had somebody, you know, at the time, Joseph Kenyon, who was, you know, this really brilliant guy, thought of as one of the most brilliant scientists in the United States. And it really epitomized the hard science of, you know, this is the birth of modern medicine where, you know, it's the birth of this new modern medicine and this new era of medicine where, you know, people in lab coats with microscopes are developing uh, treatments for diphtheria and all these other things. It really seemed like this was the start of the modern age in so many ways. And, but at the same time, he's then sent to a place where he has to fight, you know, the most, one of the most ancient diseases in human history, one of the scariest, and he fails in so many ways because he is not, it's not only, it only doesn't only take that hard science, it takes that social, that soft side of science as well. And that's where the other main character in the book, Rupert Blue, you know, he was never thought of as a genius. He barely got through medical school and his real trait was affability. You know, he had this talent to make people like him and trust him. And that's when, you know, as we go through this pandemic, you start to see how much you need that second side as much as you need the first, you know, it's the first two or three months, it's, you know, we're going to have a vaccine and that vaccine is going to be maybe a year from now, maybe six months, you know, how fast can we do this? Which medicine can help prevent or slow the, the progress of the disease. But in the meantime, you have to do something. And in that, some, that meantime, you have to get people to trust you and trust that the information is true and that it can matter and save, you know, not only their lives, but the lives of people you care about. And I think that's one of the big breakdowns that we're seeing now where, you know, state by state, there might be one level of trust in authorities or even a trust in science in one place. And there might be another sense of trust in another place, which is why it's so confusing to live right now. You know, when you get on a plane, not that I have, but you know, people who do, who do get on the plane, there's, you know, a revolt over, should I wear a mask? Do I have to wear a mask or not? And where it seems like it's a really weird time because we're not all on the same page. And when you look back to how San Francisco had to deal with the bubonic plague outbreak, it was the exact same thing. You had the medical establishment in the city itself saying one thing, and you had the, you know, the elected officials and the government and the governor saying another thing. And then you had the media within San Francisco itself saying, you know, this is all a hoax. You don't need to believe this. Where you had, you know, Hearst and other newspaper chains through the rest of the country saying, you know, never go to San Francisco. You're going to, essentially, you're going to die. So it was this big vacuum of what do we know and, and what should we trust? And I had no idea that, that we we're going to live through the same thing very quickly. Yeah, I, I, I'm just struck that I think we, we, I think when you spend time looking at history, it, it doesn't really matter where you pick. Like, you, I, I think it's easy if you don't study it to think of there being sort of inevitable progress. You know what I mean? Like, science is inevitably progressing. Like, knowledge is we're always getting more knowledge, and we're always moving toward progress. And I think both your book and mine actually are about how there are these political problems mm -hmm. that are totally independent of the rest of this body of knowledge we're acquiring. And they are often the same political problems over and over, and they have to be kind of solved over and over, you know, like on immigration to me, like, I think it's easy to sort of ask, people have even asked me since my book came out sort of like, well, what would you do? Like, how do we fix it? And yeah. it's a little bit like what you're describing with science. It's not actually just a like, here's the answer, right, mm -hmm. on a plate, and then we just have to apply it, and then we're done. 
it's a political problem. So it takes, you know, it takes charismatic people, it takes convincing, it takes empathy, right? All these other skills and ideas, and it takes a democracy. You know, I think right now with, with COVID, it feels like our democracy was kind of weak to begin with. So talking about wearing a mask becomes this like crisis, you know, because we can't resolve anything together. Um, and immigration too, it feels to me like we just struggle with basic questions of who should be here and who shouldn't. And because we can't answer them together, you know, as a democratic system politically, it's hard to get the legislation too. And these things are all connected. But yeah, I think science is like, and I, it was, I was struck in my book too, eugenics is used so powerfully to get behind immigration. And so you also see the way that science can be used for political ends too. That, that's one thing that when you, when you look back, you read a history book or you know, most times when you're taught history, it really is dates and facts. And it seems like there's just this, everything goes in one direction. Right. And I realized that, you know, just like now people are complicated. You know, Ken Yoon was a, was a brilliant man, but at the same time, he couldn't look past that outer shell of race. He really knew how the human body worked on a, on a cellular level, but he was still stuck by skin color and ethnicity and everything else. And it really took somebody to look past that to make all of the other things that he was so brilliant in actually apply them. Um, one thing I was curious about with your book too, you know, it seems like the racial history of our country, it seems like a lot of times it's boiled down to the South, you know, African-Americans, the South, people who were enslaved, all of that. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, one thing I was struck with your book, it's not just one area, it's the geography, you know, and the San Francisco plague outbreak really showed the anti-Asian bigotry, the, the anti-Chinese sentiment. Did you see that um, in other places in the country and how did that apply with um, how laws were changed? Yeah, I, it's funny you put it that way because I had not thought of it, but it's true. Like I the South is actually, it comes up a little bit in my book because there are these segregationist senators from the South who have, you know, very like, you know, very white nationalist views. But most of the book is actually about people in the Northeast where immigrants actually settle, right? Like yeah. all the Italians and Jews who came, they changed New York. That's, that's, yeah. they changed cities like New York. Eastern European immigrants transformed Chicago. And then Asian immigrants, of course, changed the Pacific Northwest and they changed California. And so, yeah, I think like once you, you know, the history of the South is so much about white, black segregation and Jim Crow. Once you kind of leave that area and you're talking about immigrants, suddenly, you know, I think for instance, one thing I felt like I got to spend a lot of time thinking about is, you know, who's counted as white. And so if you think about race in New York, at the turn of the 20th century, race for, for people living then is not, you know, the Jews and Italians who are showing up don't seem white to them. They're not, they're not Protestant. They're not wasps, essentially. And so that's why they begin to pass these laws. They think of them as really different and as outsiders, racially even. And over time, they the idea of who's white expands to include them. But if we're talking about race, race history in America, I would absolutely point to New York in the 1920s as a really important time period to understand because you see people sort of guarding what it means to be white and being very protective of it and deciding that some people just don't count. And then, you know, on the opposite coast in the Pacific Northwest, as you know very well from your book, like Asians were considered, you know, Chinese in particular were considered these sort of lowly, you know, dirty laborers. And I'm so struck that the stereotype now is so different, right? It's like, the assumption is if you're if you're Asian American, you're highly educated, you know, the stereotype is like highly educated model minority doctors, engineers, and that's our immigration laws choosing these people. Like people aren't inherently like that. It's like we we have laws that prioritize people with certain skills. And so that's why they are here. And so I think we we just as a country, I feel like we could just use a lot more understanding of how our laws shape how we see people's races. That like you people, there are certain people here because they're chosen historically by their race. That's what we did for 40 years between the 20s and the 60s. And even once we got rid of the racial quotas, we still select people based on things like education. Mm -hmm. And so that then begins to shape really who's here and it shapes our understanding of what Asian Americans are even like. Um, and it's amazing to me that we went from, you know, the 1880s when they seemed like, you know, these low class, you know, laborers, and that was the stereotype all the way to now where the stereotype is, you know, wealthy, highly educated, which 
doesn't really match reality entirely too. You know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, Asian Americans, it's this is to me a really important data point, the greatest income inequality, um, they have the greatest income inequality of, out of any racial group. And so our stereotypes aren't even matching reality anymore, but these laws are just constantly shaping how we see race in America. I think that's fascinating. And, you know, also, you know, having young kids, I mean, the kids are seven and five, you start to think about how are they going to learn history? And, you know, I grew up in California, in Southern California, in a town that was majority non-white. You know, this high school I went to was majority non-white. The college I went to was majority non-white. And even then, you learn very little about contemporary U.S. history, you know, it seems like, you know, even taking AP U.S. history and everything else, it really, you hit World War I, you hit World War II, you hit those big sweeping things. You learn a lot about Churchill. You learn very little about the Asian American experience in California or the Mexican American experience in California or anything in long race or ethnicity that is not this easy narrative of, you know, the Union and the, the Confederacy. And I think that as we start to start to you know unpeel that and see how we've had these different experiences in life and we've had these different laws that really make what we have now, you start to understand how we get to how we get to now. And once you start to understand how you get to now, then you start to see okay, how will this change going forward? Um, you know, kind of going back to COVID, you start to see this is how we've reacted, um, and maybe it's human nature to react to a certain way to an outbreak. Um, and start to show the fault lines in a society, whether those are racial, whether those are income inequality, whether whatever those are, whether, you know, understanding of acceptance and science. Um, and then those times of crisis really let you see what you kind of is under there, they're all the, under the surface all the time that's just very easy to ignore. Yeah, and I feel like history also lets you see the possibilities, right? Both like good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it just sort of expands my imagination for what is possible. And, um, you know, that's why I think for both you and I, it's just, I think we, we in a way lucked out that we, we got interested in subjects that feel really, really modern, even yeah. though we were digging around in history that, I mean, for you, I'm, I'm even fascinated, like, I found the twenties hard to research because it's just hard, right? I, the book covers a long period of time. As I got deeper and closer to now, I just kept breathing a sigh of relief. Like, oh, finally, like congressional record <laughs> is easier to search. Like these clips yeah. are easier to search. Um, so I, I, I imagine for you too, like reading, you know, when you're living in the moment, you understand too that historians someday will look back at this time. And and what, what I guess I, I would, I would, I'm curious what you think of that. Like, how do you, having looked at a pandemic, right, that's more than 100 years old, how do you think historians will try to make sense of right now? I think one of the big issues I ran into was that, you know, the, the plague when it happened, newspapers, you know, the kind of voice of record at the time didn't really want to acknowledge what was happening. So you found very little information about the victims. And that was one of the things I was really trying to do is, you know, try to flesh out the fact that the people who were died, they were people, you know, they, they had strengths, they had weaknesses, they had friends who loved them, they had people they just didn't like, you know, they were flesh and blood and all that encompasses who we are. And trying to make a sense that, you know, they aren't just numbers, they weren't just the others who, who were dying. And I think that's one of the things that um, might be challenging now, both a challenge and a, a benefit at this time is that, you know, we get, it's a lot easier to find who is dying or who is being affected and we can tell their individual stories. Um, you know, one thing I ran into was that, you know, I, I, I don't speak Chinese, I don't read Chinese. So trying to find the, you know, the historical documents, whether Chinese language newspapers or, or anything else to, to really tell individual stories, that was the biggest challenge for me. And luckily I found uh, a medical researcher, I think he's at UC San Francisco, who had done a lot of that translation work. So was able to kind of dovetail on somebody else's work. Um, now I think, you know, you already hear, you see magazine stories, you, you know, people are working on deeply reported it, things like, you know, staying at a particular hospital in, in Queens and seeing how nurses or doctors work for the entire year and really tr staying with them and, st and seeing their story day by day. I think that'll be very important for historians in the future. Um, I also think that, and I think I saw a comedian say this, you know, that we're going to look back and 2020 is just going to be a shorthand for, you know, the world going crazy that, you know, that, oh, that was, how was, how was your night last night? Oh, it was 2020. <laughs> it was just where everything is happening at once. We've kind of turned up the dial to, to past 10. We're at 11. 
and trying to get a sense that all of this is happening. We have a pandemic, we have the largest unemployment since the Great Depression, we have landmark Supreme Court decisions coming in, it seems like daily now, um, and you know everything else. And also we have a climate crisis on top of it. So it's gonna, I think the hardest thing for a historian in the future is to say, I can't do everything, but you know, I have to have this chapter and follow this through line, but my con my paragraphs or my you know chapters on context, that's gonna be half the book as well, because how else can you explain that everything was happening at the same time? Yeah, and I even, you know, in my my day work, I know you're a working journalist too, like what I try to do is do want do stories that try to make sense of now, but I think having worked on a book of history. I have so much more humility about doing that because even when I was doing my book, I kept wondering like 1920s, like what was going on in America? Like, it seems like kind of like now, like things were kind of going haywire. Everyone was just really upset and jingoistic. And there were, there was just, you know, there were, uh, you know, racist attacks constantly. Like it was just such a fraught, conflicted time. And even now, a hundred years later, people are still arguing over why that happened. Like what fed into that feeling? And I, I remember when I was working my book, I was like, I couldn't even explain to you 2016 clearly. Like I'm living in it and yeah. I'm struggling to make sense of it too. Um, but I think that's why reading these books is just so, so fascinating because you just see what a challenge it is, even with the passage of time to make sense of, of what is going on at any given moment. That's one thing I find has been nice about doing, you know, the daily journalism and also doing a book at the same time is that sometimes when you're writing, on a, writing a book, you're thinking, you know, who's ever going to read this? How am I going to ever make sense of all this? You know, is this ever going to turn into something? And then it's nice to say, well, you know what? I also can write something that would be out if it has to be in 15 minutes if something happens right away. And then sometimes when you're doing something, you know, I'm going to write something that has a shelf life of maybe you know, two hours, maybe three days, especially if you're covering the stock market like I do. It's hard to look back and say, oh, well, two weeks, that, that happened, it's gone. But then you start, oh, I'd love to have something that will last longer. So having that kind of barbell of right on the news and then maybe think, stepping back and thinking, what does the news really mean? Is a nice kind of, nice feel to go back between those two things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, you have, what, do you have another project that you're already working on? I do, it's actually due in about four weeks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right, right at the end of it. Um, and it's also one of those things that, hey, let's see, let's, how about you write a book and, you know, still work it, still work your day job all the time. And by the way, also, there's also going to be a pandemic and your kid's going to be in the house all the time. <laughs> so, I, yes, I am. Uh, yeah. No. And, and do you take leave when you write your books? No, I don't. Because it's actually, I typically just wake up very early. So I like to do, I, I find that there's just a limit of how long you can work on a book without you know, diminishing returns. And for me, it's about two or three hours. So if I can work, you know, if I wake up at four and work until seven and then, you know, then sleep on the train right in, then that's okay. It works out that way for me. Um, did you take a leave for your book? I did not. So, and I was pregnant um, when I was finishing it. I, I probably wrote most of it while pregnant, turned in the manuscript, I think my second version probably four or five days before I went into labor early, <laughs> was doing copy edits with a new, like truly a newborn. And, um, you know, I'm not saying I would repeat that experience, but it did, it did make me realize, I mean, you can actually, you can get a lot done and having yeah. a creative project like a book is just so much fun to do on top of everything else. And it does really broaden. I mean, the way I feel when I read a history book, it really broadens your understanding of the present. Um, so what is the project then? What are you, uh, what's about? It's about the discovery of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And how, oh my gosh. And essentially it's the step back of like, how did the discovery of dinosaurs and the acceptance of dinosaurs go from this oddity that, you know, some naturalists in Britain discovered and talked about to being a landmark part of pop culture. And then how does that change our acceptance of science and the start of the acceptance of you know, climate change and the fact that the earth's history is very, very long and much longer than we ever expected. So kind of going, getting people to dinosaurs really seemed like the linchpin that made us say as a society that, you know, the earth is not only 6,000 years old or, or whatever it is for you know, some religious text. It's infinitely long, essentially. And life has changed and earth has changed. And how does that make us, how does that make us see ourselves differently? And how does that make us see Earth's future differently? So that what about sounds you? fascinating. <laughs> I, I, I can't wait to read that book um, <laughs> as, a, as someone who was fairly obsessed with dinosaurs as a child. And I hope my child will grow into another dinosaur obsessive. I, uh... I, I have to say it was actually my son's idea. We 
he was in kindergarten then. We went to the American History of, you know, the American Museum of Natural History. And we're there in the dinosaur halls, you know, walking around. Then it gets really quiet. And I thought, oh no, like, these are too scary. You know, the, the T-Rex, his tooth is as big as my son. This is just too much for him. And then he looks, turns up and looks at me and says, like, dad, who found these bones? And I thought, that's, thank you. <laughs> you know, like, now I want to tell the, you know, the human story behind these prehistoric bones, that these just as much as immigration history and, and medical history, it really is a history of people. Dinosaurs in many ways are history of people because people had to go find them. People had to give them meaning and people had to, to display them and really make them a part of culture. Um, so they really are a reflection of us in so many ways. That's fascinating. I love that. So are you working on another book too? I don't have an idea quite yet. I mean, I feel in some ways, like when you finish a book, the more I talk about it with people, the more I feel like I'm still writing that book. <laughs> like there are things <laughs> that I didn't get to that I want to dig into more. Um, I don't know yet. I mean, I think I want to, I, I want to look for an idea and maybe through what I work on too. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. I edit a lot of national coverage and I just think this country is endlessly fascinating. So I suspect it'll be more American history, whatever it is. That's, that's fascinating. That's actually how I fell into the plague book was I wrote it like the previous book I wrote before that was about the family that used to own all of Malibu and, and how they got it and how they lost it. You know, why celebrities live there now. And it really was something as simple as one of the main characters in that time going up to San Francisco and, and writing a letter back to his wife saying, you know, there's rumors that the plague is here. And sometimes it's that one small thing, whether it's in a news story or whether it's you're reading something else and it's just, you know, a footnote or something that's tossed aside, it feels like tossed aside to us. Yeah. Then you're like, wait, this is just like a, a portal into this other world that's so, so interesting. Yeah. And then you get to write the book. I mean, to me, the standard for writing, it was like, I want to write the book that I want to read, you know, that if I weren't the author, this is, this is something that I would want to spend time with. So yeah. Well, thank you for talking with me this afternoon. Well, thank you for talking with me too. Yeah. This was so much fun.